And now we will meet the candidates for House of Delegates District 99, the incumbent, Republican Wayne Clark. Delegate Clark, good morning. Thank you for coming in today. Good morning. Thank you for having us. And the Democrat, Osmond Antonio Anderson. Osmond, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you both being here. You'll get a minute for an opening statement, and then we'll reverse the order for the closing statement in between. Former Berkeley County Commission President Bill Stubblefield and the editor of the Independent Observer newspaper, Steve Pearson, will have questions for you. If your name is brought up in the course of your opponent's uh, discussion or an answer to a subject, you have the right to a direct response at the conclusion of their statement. Now, we'll begin with opening statements, and with that, we will begin with the incumbent, Delegate Wayne Clark. Well, thank you. Thank you, WNR&R, &R, uh, for putting on this very important debate. As a state delegate representing Jefferson County, I have a four-year record of various issues important to our community, including protecting the rights of the unborn, expanding education choice, and making West Virginia more business-friendly for all businesses, especially small businesses. I plan to continue my efforts through my leadership roles on the House Economic Development and Tourism Committee and the House Education Committee improving the quality of education in our state and continuing to foster our charter schools and hope scholarship opportunities as a key part of educating a workforce that makes West Virginia attractive to businesses that wish to locate here and support local businesses that are born here in our community. I have lived in our community for over 20 years and have grown a local business that employs over 50 people. Not only do I have the experience of working with colleagues in Charleston, but I also have experience as a local city councilman and on various needs and challenges my district has. I have a record of success and I've been the lead or co-sponsor of 58 bills that have become law in my four years, including key tourism and charter school bills. Tourism is the largest industry in Jefferson County and we need to compete better with neighboring states in the tourism business. That doesn't necessarily matter to colleagues in the middle of the state and doesn't have the same competitive disadvantages issues we have. But to advance Jefferson County priorities, I work to find common ground with mut and mutual benefit that demonstrates the rising, that rising tides raise all ships and that we must work together to make West Virginia a great state to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Clark. Osmond, Antonio Anderson. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. I got 35 cards. I was, going, I was intending to use them, but I'm not. I got my bio. I was going to intend to use this, but I'm not. My name is Osmond Anderson. I'm running for the House of Delegate here in District 99. When I'm elected into office, trust and accountability is key. As a retired Army veteran, this part I don't like because I always wanted to make it about the residents. Me saying I did 22 years in the Army doesn't matter. Me saying I'm pursuing the PhD in organization leadership, that's not what the residents want to hear. I want to make it about them. Them saying that I am a husband, that's important because I want you to know I'm a family man. So I am a husband. I have two daughters. I got seven grandkids and I got six great grandkids. And I understand the importance of service. 22 years in the military, serving under three commanders in chief. I, got a deep, I have a deep passion for serving this community. Again, the word is trust and accountability. There is a disconnect. That alone w made me wanted to run for this seat. I'm going to be voted in this seat because of hometown meetings. This is part of my introduction. It's important for them to know hometown meeting, there's a disconnect. If we've been going through what we're going through now and we're sitting here today for the last four years or eight years, there's a problem. There's time for transformation. Vote Osmond Anderson, District 99. I am your candidate. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we'll begin with the first questions. Bill. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Do you support home rule for counties? Start first with uh, the incumbent. So a little bit about home rule. Uh, I was lucky to be one of the um, leading um, uh, writers of Home Rule uh, for the city of Charleston, Charlestown. Uh, as we all know, the city of Charlestown was one of the pilot uh, cities that wrote in Home Rule, and it gave the city an opportunity to do some amazing things. Uh, it gave the opportunity for us to work with our police and fire departments and gave us an opportunity as a city to um, really grow overall some of the things we need in regards to infrastructure. 
when you look at home rule for a county, I'm going to say this. If the county's only reason for in, in, uh, enacting home rule is to get that additional 1% sales tax without some sort of a cut, then I'm against it. I don't like to raise taxes. I can tell you two uh, debates ago, last night my opponent didn't show up for, for a debate, but two debates ago my opponent clearly said that they were going to raise taxes. So I'm sure that they're going to answer in this setting that they are for home rule and raising taxes. I am not. Mr. Anderson? I appreciate that, Wayne, because he's correct. I am for raising taxes. I feel that if we can go to the gas pump, if gas was $7 a gallon, we would pay $7 a gallon. So if we're going to put the money to advance the community, I think it's okay for us to pay more taxes. We're going to complain about something. Is it taxes? Is it gas? Or it's going to be something else? At the end of the day, anything that's going to help move this community forward with the residents, voice included, because I'm all about the residents. I'm not about I. It's about them. I say raise the taxes, yes. You did bring up my name. Yeah. I cannot sit here and tell the citizens of the 99th District or the state of West Virginia that we need to be paying $7 for gas. That's not what I said. That's not what I said. I said if gas, excuse me, was $7 a gallon, that's the part is key, we'll pay it. Because at the end of the day, it can be $8, you're still going to pay it. So my point, if taxes go up and we see the community moving forward, I don't think that the residents will have a problem paying more taxes. That's what I said. Mr. Pearson. Okay, well, let's keep talking about uh, taxes. Why not? Um, state government's been running a surplus uh, for the past several years. Do you think the state should use those surplus funds to cut the taxes, uh, to build up reserves because they fluctuate up and down? Or should it increase funding for specific programs? And who went first last time? Wayne had the first. Well, then I'll direct it to Mr. Anderson. Thank you so much for that question. The first thing you said was surplus. That's scary. Just that word alone. But I believe if that money can be used to benefit something else in the county, to advance it forward, I'm going to say yes, that's what that money should be used on. Delegate okay. Clark? All right. So um, surplus. I'd rather be in a surplus than a deficit. Um, I happily voted for the $750 million personal income tax in 2023. Stood on the stage with the governor as he signed it. Happily voted last week for an additional 2% reduction in a personal income tax because we have the surplus. We also have a 4% reduction that happened in July because in the uh, the bill that we passed in 23, it has automatic triggers. Every time we've reached $250 million in surplus, it automatically buys down the personal income tax by an additional 4%. So I think what we're doing with the surplus to give back to the citizens is the right thing we're doing. And I don't want to see anybody raise taxes on anyone. Okay. Let me ask a follow-up on this one. Sure. Because um, it relates to the uh, Public Employees Insurance Agency, PEIA. Yes. And as you probably are both aware, you know, they had a board meeting a couple of days ago and their, their plans about raising uh, rates. Um, and this is for state employees, county employees. 14% premium increase, 40% increase in deductibles. This goes back to 2023. The, you know, the state legislature voted to reset the cost sharing back to 80-20. So should the legislature be rethinking that? Does the legislature, the state need to be covering more of these insurance premiums to offset these cost increases so we're not further burdening our uh, state and municipal employees? And we'll start with Mr. Clark and we'll walk back. All right. I, I, I see where you're going in regards to should the state be involved more, maybe a 82 to 8 percent um, contribution. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a frustrating thing. We just passed an $87 million uh, appropriation to PEIA to give them a, uh, a, not a rainy day, but a reserve for expenses because as expenses are going up, now, one of the things that they said, one of the reasons why they're in a, a cash crunch is because of the prescription drugs, uh, more specifically some of these uh, diabe diabetes drugs. Um, you know, my wife, who has MS, um, love her to death. Um, we know that, um, and she's also type 2, so she's on the Ozempic. We just went to the, the 
pharmacy, and it was nine hundred dollars was our copay. Okay, I'm 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 under PEIA. My wife is a teacher here in in the state of West Virginia, so it was nine hundred dollars, which was our copay. Now, the good news is, I, I, is we stopped some major increase in PIA because when they presented to us in caucus they said that they were going to have to raise 24 percent if we did not fund this 87 million dollars we funded the 87 million dollars hopefully when the board meets back at the end of the month they reevaluate what is going on because a lot of that conversation happened before we actually made that funding so hopefully they reevaluate it and and if they have to raise because of the prescription drugs it's 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 hard but PIA is is really struggling so, and at least it's not going to be 24%. Maybe it's only 2 or 3%. One other point to understand is every time that we give teachers and service personnel and police officers raises who are on PEIA, because PEIA is based off of income bracket, not off of off the job. So as we give them more money, so their premiums go up too. That is one of the issues with PEIA in regards to its original structure. Mr. Anderson. Your thoughts? My thoughts is I believe PIA should go up. And I'm saying that because at the end of the day, our teachers are underpaid. I'm going to stay with PIA, but I'm going somewhere with this, okay? And I get that. So if our teachers are underpaid and they want to make more money, they will have X amount of dollars to afford PIA. I mean, it's, a, it's just one of those situations to where it ain't going to go down, even if they revisit it. I'm with Mr. Clark. It shouldn't go up to 24%. At the end of the day, you know, I just want to do what's right for the residents. So if PIA is a problem, we need to start paying our teachers and our law enforcement more money so it can be affordable for them. Thank you. Mr. Stubblefield. Gentlemen, uh, do you support certificate of need? That's a big issue in the Eastern Pan Am. Who would you like to start with, Phil? Uh, go with the delegate, sorry. It's funny, is when we were down in Charleston, a special session, I had a... a, a uh, a dinner meeting with Valley Health and one of the things that we were strategizing on is how do we do a full repeal of c certificate of need this year not another skinny not another you know getting rid of imaging or birthing centers or not 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 a onesie twosie let's go for the whole thing this year CON is crippling our health care in uh, industry and we need to get rid of it and it needs to go away now would you have excuse me i'll come back to you in a second yes sir uh, but would you uh, uh see carve outs for organizations such as hospice absolutely absolutely hospice you know it, it, that's always been a priority is maintaining hospice in regards to what they do um unfortunately i i had my experience with hospice when my father passed away and uh, in 2007 so um, hospice needs to stay in in the position where they're at. Mr. Anderson? When it comes to the certificates I believe like anything else it needs to be revisited. It needs to be revisited and it needs to take care of the residents here in Jefferson County whether it's hospice whether it's any other organization that's in need Yes, it is a problem. It's a problem now. It was a problem four years ago. It's been a problem eight years ago. We're here today still talking about the same thing. So I'm saying that to say is that it needs to be revisited. Yes, we do look. We do need to look at other ways of introducing and regulating it so it can benefit all residents of West Virginia. Thank you. Mr. Pierce. Okay. So do you think that the uh, reorganization of the Department of Health and Human Services into three separate departments has adequately addressed the issues with the child foster care system? And what additional changes would you propose to the Department of Human Services where foster services ended up? So I'll start with the uh, I'm glad you asked me that question because um, I was a foster parent um, in the state of Maryland. And, you know, that's very, very sensitive to me because, you know, unfortunately those kids, they get caught up in the system. And you just want to just love on them and you get attached to them. But back to your question is that um, I, don't think that this, I don't think that the state of West Virginia should break down to three different elements. I think it's no, it's it's not a one size fit all type situation. You know, you have to look at everything case by case, in my opinion. So when it comes to the foster care and child care and stuff like that, I'm all for you know what's doing right for the the, the residents of West Virginia. We come along, have a town hall meeting, 
and let's get a grip on this and let's just go to Charleston and knock on some doors and say, hey, look, you know, we need to implement a better system than what we have in place. Mr. Clark. So absolutely separating DHS into three separate entities was the right thing to do. Let's keep in mind that they were an $8 billion uh, bill that the state of West Virginia and the federal government had to had to do. Um, in that process, right after we passed, we, we separated, I said, we're going to start to find money. And guess what? We did. So not only part of this 2% reduction that, uh, for the personal income tax that we had, we also reduced $22 million from DHS of money that was going and not being spent. So we were able to claw that back. So we reduced the size of government. That's two great things. In regards to child care and foster care, you, you all know that I'm a huge proponent of putting in some sort of a program. I have two things. I, I'm introducing a bill that will take child services away from DHS, child, early childhood education, move it over to the Department of ed Education, on, and because we're already requiring our, our, our providers to go through the same things that teachers have to go to, through to get certified, and then a three-tier system in regards to payment. One, using money that's already been allocated to DHS. Two, employer pay and giving employers tax incentives for paying that. And three, the parents. So that will help us reduce the cost overall for child care in the state of West Virginia. And then moving it over to the Department of Education, because it is education. That's when the kids' minds are growing the fastest and they're absorbing the most information. Children who go through child care facilities tend to excel in schools better. Children who are t stay at home and are taken care of by their parents that are homeschooling during that process tend to do better in school. So absolutely child care needs to move from DHS over to the Department of Education. Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, we've talked earlier this morning, and I, and I hear from a lot of folks in the local area about groundwater and the protection of groundwater. Uh, DEP, or uh, yeah, DEP has responsibility for the quality, but they don't have, they do not address the quantity issue. Uh, is this, and I know the, the local government has concern about the quantity, is this something that the state level should be conscious of and getting involved with, the quantity? Uh, groundwater, and I'll start again with a delegate. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I, I am happy to say that I was one of the co-sponsors for the PFAS bill um, that passed uh, in, in 23 um, that was led by Clay Riley. Uh, one of the things we have to understand is in Jefferson County and Berkeley County in the eastern panhandle, uh, we have some of the highest uh, uh, amounts of PFAS in our water. I'll get, okay. I'll get to the second part, yes. Um, and that is because our water comes, from, that contaminants come from western Pennsylvania, Ohio, all of that. So we have to address that. The other thing is we have to make sure that, you know, we went through one of the worst droughts um, in, in, in Jefferson County history this, this year. Uh, and as a golf course owner, I suffered from it as well as many others. And there was many of our farmers that had their wells dry up. They don't, there's not enough water uh, here. So, yes, we have to get involved and we have to figure out how to make this a better place. You know, we want to keep the farms. We want to keep our, our agricultural businesses, you know, especially our horse racing uh, industry. Um, you're talking about a $9 million revenue to Jefferson County annually from, from horse, horse racing and the economic impact. We have to do something. So, yes, the state has to get involved in protecting the water and the quality of our water. Mr. Anderson? I might not talk as long as Mr. Clark, but everything he said was well put. Not that I'm piggybacking, but I'm going to just keep it cut and dry. And, um, when it comes to well water, you know, there's something like anything else or bill that we're having problems with, we've been having problems with for the last four years, that we need to revisit, get the residents involved, and we need to come up with a solution to move the community forward and make it better as far as well water. Thank you. We will uh, move to closing statements now. And we'll begin with the challenger, Mr. Anderson. You may go first, first of all, I want to thank you all for having me today. And uh, again, my name is Osmond Anderson, running for the House of Delegate in District 99. I have a deep passion of serving, period, the community, 22 years in the military. And I want to continue to serve. I want to be a voice for the people. I want to fight for the people. And I want to stand up for the people. 
But the most important thing out of all that I just said, it's about integrity, it's about trust, and it's about accountability. We need the residents to hold the elected officials accountable. You all will elect us in two to four years later. We'll post up a sign saying re-elect me and let's finish what we started. I don't want to be that candidate. I want to be the candidate right off the gate, just being honest with them, bring back the town halls meeting. The town hall meetings are very important because it allows your residents and you to get up close and personal and have that two-way conversation. You know, one thing about me when I'm sitting up here, I, I want to take away that word I. There's no I in team. It's about the residents. And once we leave focus on, lose focus on them, that's when it becomes a problem. And that's what's been going on for the last four years. It's time for change. It's time for transformation. The time is now. Because if you keep the same individuals, and I'm not throwing shade in the seat, we're going to be here another four years in front of you guys talking about the same thing. Let's get it done. Vote Osmond Anderson, District 99. Thank you. Delegate Wayne Clark. Well, again, thank you, WNRNR, for putting on this very important debate. Um, I'm Wayne Clark. I'm running for the 99th District. Yes, I'm running for my, my third term. Uh, I can probably say that I'm probably one of the most effective legislators in, in the state of West Virginia, 58 bills in four years. I mean, just think about that perspective. Um, I'm the vice chairman of economic development. I'm a senior member uh, on the education committee, and I plan on staying on those, on those two committees. I am down there. I work. I love my job. I love being in Charleston. I love working for the folks of uh, Jefferson County and, and the 99th District. I am active. I am at many, many city halls. I am at many town halls. I am at many HOA meetings. I am active in just about everything that I do. Just to give you an example, and, and, and I love my family to death. You know, Wendy, my wife, and Megan and Maddie, my twin girls that just turned 18, I spent 134 days this year away from my house, away from my house, in a hotel room to represent the people of the 99th District. I don't know how many people would do that. I ask for your vote on November 5th. I want to thank you both for coming to our forum today, or the foreman for that matter, okay. and I wish you both the best of luck on Election Day.